Hello, welcome to Chapter 7, Homework Questions 96 to 101. Question 96, find an exponential function that passes through each pair of points. So there's two examples, and I'm going to do each of them a different way so you can see the different versions of how you could do this. Uh, on the first one, we will use a table to help us figure this one out. And this is the way that we originally did it when we were looking at multiple representations. So when we're going to set up the table, I do want to include 0 since it is my initial, and then I will go from there. So 1 is 7.5, 2 I don't know, and then 3 is 16.875. So what we're trying to do is figure out what the multiplier is, but to do that, 7.5 times b would give us 2, but we don't know that one, so we'd have to multiply it by b again to get the 3. So then we can take that information and say that 7.5 times b times b should equal 16.875. So if we divide by 7.5 to both sides, b times b is b squared, and then we're going to take 16.875 divided by 7.5 and that is 2.25. So we can now eliminate the b squared by doing the square root. You don't need the twos there, but to indicate that that does cancel out. And so now we need to take the square root of 2.25 and we get a value of 1.5 for the multiplier. So we don't need to know what two is, but we can find out the value of zero by working backwards. So if I wanna work backwards from the 7.5 to get to the y-coordinate when x is 0, I'm going to need to take the 7.5 and work backwards. Instead of multiplying by 1.5, I'm going to divide by 1.5, and that'll give you a value of 5. So every single time, you can check, since your b value is 1.5, if you take 5 times 1.5, you get 7.5. And then if you do continue on, you don't have to, but if you do continue on, 7.5 times 1.5 is 11.25, and then if you take 11.25 times 1.5, you should get the 16.875. So we have the information that we need. We have the initial value, is it 0, 5, and we now have the multiplier, which we just found out as well. So we can write our equation in y equals a times b raised to the x form. y is equal to a, which is 5, that's the initial, times b, that's 1.5, raised to the x power. So that's the way to write an exponential function, uh, kind of using the table instead of algebraically going through all that. Now, let's take a look at b, and we're going to do the same thing, but now instead of using a table, we're going to go through and, and use the algebra in terms of setting up a system. So we're going to use our general form, y equals ab raised to the x power, we're going to plug in the values we know. So this would be 1.25 is equal to a times b, and then x is negative 1, and then our second equation will be 0 0.032, that's your y value, is equal to a, b raised to the x, which in this case is 3. So we're going to solve for a, divide by um, b raised to the negative 1, in the first equation, so a is equal to 1.25 divided by b to the negative 1. Now, we can actually simplify this one because b to the negative 1, uh, we can simplify the negative exponent by moving it to the numerator, the reciprocal of b, or 1 over b is b, so we can change this to 1.25 b to the first power, makes it look a little bit better, and now we can take that and substitute it, we can use substitution, and substitute it into the other equation. So 0 0.032 is equal to a, which we're going to replace with 1.25b times b cubed. So 0 0.032 is equal to 1.25b to the fourth, because we're going to add our exponents. We can then divide by 1.25. And we will get 0 0.0256 is equal to b to the fourth power. And now we can use the inverse, which is the fourth root of b to the fourth, to figure out what b is. And that gives us a b value of 0 0.4.
So now we are able to take the B value, plug it back into one of our equations. I'm going to go over here, since it's already solved for A, 1.25 times B, 0 0.4, and we will get a value of 0 0.5. So we know our initial is 0 0.5, the multiplier is 0 0.4, so the equation is Y equals A, that's our initial, times the multiplier of B, which is 0 0.4, raised to the X power. So, both methods are fine. Uh, if you're using the table method, um, just make sure that you're, you're looking for the B value in terms of that multiplier, so you're still solving some equations. Uh, but B is more algebraic uh, in the sense of you're setting up a system and actually solving a system. But either method is fine. Question 97. Consider the pattern at the right. Continue the pattern to find 1 over 2 to the negative 1, 1 over 2 to the negative 2, and so on. So we see that we have 1 over 2 to the 0 is 1, 1 over 2 to the 1st is 2, 1 half, 1 over the 2 to the 2nd is 1 fourth, 1 over 2 to the 3rd is 1 eighth. So we're going to continue this pattern, so I'm going to show it over to the right here and then I'll, I can move it. But So that's 2 to the negative 1, and so look at what's happening. Each time it is getting multiplied by 2. So 1 eighth times 2 is 1 fourth, 1 fourth times 2 is 1 half, 1 half times 2 is 1, so 1 times 2 would be equal to 2. And then we can continue this pattern, 1 over 2 to the negative 2, so 2 times 2 is 4, 1 over 2 to the negative 3, 4 times 2 is 8, and 1 over 2 to the negative fourth would be 16. So I'm not going to move all that, but this would be part A to continue the pattern. On part B, it says, what is the value of 1 over 2 to the negative n? So how would I write that? If we're continuing to multiply by 2 every time, what's a way that I could write it so that I would know for any power of negative n? And if you look at the denominator, 2 to the negative 1, if that was a positive 1, it would be 2. If that was a positive 2, 2 to the second would be 4. Same thing with the next one, 2 to the third would be 8. So it looks like we can just rewrite this as 2 raised to the positive n on that one. And then C, write a conjecture about how to rewrite 1 over a raised to the negative n without negative exponents. So does it really matter what the base is? That's what that's saying. Instead of having a 2, what if it was a 3 or something else? And it's not going to matter. So um, 1 over a raised to the negative n should be equivalent to a raised to the nth power. And then that finishes up question 97. Question 98. Find the domain and range for each of the relations graphed below. So I'll just do these to the right of the graphs. So d is a d, d. a is a discrete graph. Uh, the domain for A would just be those values. So what is the X value? Well, X is 0, 1, and 2. Those are the only numbers that exist in this graph because it's just three points. And then the range works the same way, but you just want to list the Y coordinates. So we have negative uh, 2 on this one, 0, and 1. And those are the y values. So if I write these ordered pairs, that might help. It would be 0, 1. This one over here is 1, 0. And this one here is 2, negative 2. All I did is write the x coordinates, so 0, 1, and 2. And then for the range, I wrote the y coordinates, 1, 0, and negative 2. But I wrote them in numerical order. Usually when we're writing the domain of a discrete graph, we're going to write those in numerical order. For B, we have a continuous graph, but there's a beginning and an end. So this point goes at 1, 2, and then this one over here would be negative 1, negative 1. So your domain is going to continue, or is going to contain all those values in between uh, your x and y. So x, the smallest value is negative 1, the largest value is 1. So we want to say your domain is all values of x that are greater than or equal to negative 1 and less than or equal to 1. And then you do the same thing with your range. Your largest y value is 2 and then your smallest y value 
would be right here at negative 1. So we would want to say all values of y that are greater than or equal to negative 1 and less than or equal to 2. Graph C. Now C, we have a discontinuous graph. There's a, there's a break in it. Um, but if you look, this one has an arrow, so we've got to be careful. This one doesn't. Both of these have endpoints. And then we have the open circle, which means that value is not included, at least on that, on that line. So your domain, so the domain, the largest value is 2. And then it kind of works its way. And it, 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 right here at negative 1, you might think there's a break, but it is included at negative 1, and then it continues on to infinity. So your domain would be all values of x that are less than or equal to 2. Every x value is covered that is less than or equal to 2. Your range, so your range, your y value, because the arrow continues to go up, it's going to go up forever. But as it goes down, right here at negative 1, at least there's an open circle here, but then it also goes down to negative 2. And then eventually, right here at negative 1, it is filled in. So your range value would be all values of y that are greater than or equal to negative 2. So that one's a little challenging, but you got to, even though it's broken up, you got to look at it as a whole graph. Part D. Uh, this graph is, you can see, V-shaped. It's an absolute value. The domain, your X values. So this graph continues to go left. It continues to go right. So therefore, your domain is all real numbers. Your range... It doesn't go any lower than negative 1 right here, but then it goes up in both directions. So the range is going to be all values of y that are greater than or equal to negative 1. Question 99. If f of x equals 3 times 2 raised to the x power, find the value of the expressions in part a through c, then complete parts d through f. So f of negative 1, this is equal to... 3 times 2, you're going to plug in negative 1 wherever there's an x. And so this would be 3 times uh, 2 to the negative 1 would be the reciprocal of 2, which is 1 half, so 1.5. And you can just plug that in your calculator if you want to as well. f of 0, 3 times 2 raised to the 0 power. Remember, anything raised to the 0 power except for 0 is 1. So 3 times 1 is 3. And then f of 1. So this is 3 times 2 raised to the first power. Well, 2 to the first is 2, so 3 times 2 is 6. So we completed a through c. Now we need to go on and, and look at d, e, and f. What value of x, x gives f of x equal to 12? So I'm going to move down here for this one. So now we're saying f of x. The output is 12. So I'm going to rewrite the equation. 12 equals... 3 times 2 raised to the x power. And we're trying to figure out what the x is. So we can divide by 3, and that's 4. So we have 4 equals 2 raised to the x. So 2 raised to what power is going to give you 4? Well, that would be 2 to the second power. Part E, where does the graph of this function cross the x-axis and the y-axis? Well, this is an exponential function, so it does not cross the x-axis because you have a um, horizontal asymptote. It is going to cross the y-axis, though, um, at x equals 0, which we already did earlier, and that would be at 0, 3, and then once again, the x-intercept, um, there is none because of the horizontal asymptote. And then for part f, if g of x equals 1 over 3 times x, find f of x times g of x. So f of x would be 3 times 2 raised to the x, and we're multiplying that by this g of x function, 1 over 3 to the x. So how do we simplify that? Let's just multiply straight across as two fractions and then simplify. So 3 times 2 raised to the x over 1 times 3x, which would be 3x. And then you can see we can cancel the 3s. So we have 2 raised to the x divided by x. 
And so therefore we know f of x times g of x is equal to 2 raised to the x divided by x. And you can't cancel those x's out because one is an exponent um, and the other one is just a number. Question 100. Show two steps to simplify each of the following expressions and then calculate the value of each expression. So on part A, we have 64 to the 2 thirds. We can write this two ways in terms of rewriting the 2 thirds. We can do 64 raised to the 1 third and then raise that to the second power because 1 third times 2 is 2 thirds. Or we could do 64 to the second power and then raise that to the 1 third power. So you can write them in different orders and that will actually change the way you rewrite it. So 1 third is the cube root. So we can rewrite this as the cube root of 64, and then that whole thing is raised to the second power, whereas the second one, it is the cube root of the whole thing. So you actually have the 64 squared inside the radical. And then you can simplify both of those. The top one's a little bit easier because you got the cube root of 64, and that's 4 times 4 times 4, so that'd be 4, and then 4 raised to the second power is 16. Whereas this one, if you take the... Um, if you take 64 and square it, you're going to get a value of 4,096. And then to take the cube root of that, you can plug that into your calculator, and you will get a value of 16 as well, hopefully. And there you go. So we, uh, I guess it says show two steps to simplify each of the following expressions. I kind of showed two different ways to do it and then calculated the value of each. All right, we'll do the same thing for the next one, part B. So 25 to the 5 halves, since the denominator is 2, we can rewrite it as 1 half, and then 5 times 1 half is 5 halves, and then we can also rewrite it the other way. 25 to the 5th raised to the 1 half. So the first one is the square root of 25, and then that whole thing raised to the 5th power, and then the second one is the square root of 25 to the 5th power. So square root of 25 is 5, and then 5 raised to the 5th power is a value of 3,125. And then this one, you're going to have to take 25 and raise it to the 5th power, and it's going to be a a pretty large number here. It looks like it's 9,765,625. And then if you take the square root of that, we should get 3,125 again. And for the last example, C, 81 to the 7 fourths. So we'll do the 1 fourth. Once again, looking at the denominator there, and then we can rewrite it as 1 fourth raised to the, well, 81 to the 1 fourth raised to the 7th. And then we can switch those around, do 81 to the 7th raised to the 1 fourth. So this would be the fourth root of 81, and then raise it to the 7th power, or 81 to the 7th power, and then do the fourth root of that. So you can see. The top one's going to be a little bit easier because you're taking the fourth root of 81 first, which would be 3, and then raising it to the seventh power. And then 3 to the seventh power is 2,187. Let's fix the 7 there. And then on the other one below, um, 81 to the seventh power, I don't know if I want to write that one out, that's larger. Uh, than the one before, so let's just leave it at that, and then if you take the fourth root of that, once you're done, you should get a value of 2,000, once again, 187, so 2,187. And so those are a couple different ways you can simplify um, fractional exponents. Also, before we move on to the next question, if you look, it seems like the first one, where I'm doing the one-third the one-half and the one-fourth is a little bit easier because you're actually taking the cube root on this of 64 first, this one you're taking the square root of 25 first, and then this one you're taking the fourth root of 81 first. So uh, once again, it doesn't matter. You're, you can use your calculator to, to simplify those as well. And the last question, 101. Copy and complete your diamond problems below. The pattern used in the diamond problems is shown at the right. Product on top 
um, sum on bottom. So negative 4 times negative 7 would be 28. And then if you add those two numbers together, you will get negative 11. Um, on the next one, you have the top and bottom. So we're looking for two numbers that multiply to give us negative 12. But then the same two numbers must add to give us 4. So when you multiply to get negative 12, you have less options than adding. So you have 12 and 1, uh, 3 and 4, and what, 2 and 6. So... Which one of those, and it, one of them does have to be negative, so we'll throw that in there and then move it if we need to. Which one of those is going to add up to 4? Well, the 6 and the 2, a negative 2. If you take negative 2 plus 6, that will give you 4. So it looks like we found our answer. Negative 2 times 6 is negative 12, but then negative 2 plus 6 is 4. Uh, on part C, you have x. And then you have the product of x and y. So if I'm looking for the y value, then one-half times my y should equal negative 8. So if you multiply by 2 to get rid of the one-half, that would give you negative 16. So does that make sense if you put negative 16 here? Well, half of negative 16 is negative 8, so that looks good. And then if you add those two together, you're going to get negative 15 and a half. So let me fix that. Or negative 15.5 um, as well. And then the last diamond, we're back to kind of what we had in the first one, except there's fractions. So we have the x and y. So to get the top, we need to take 1 half times 1 fifth. And just multiply straight across. So that's 1 tenth. And then we can take 1 half plus 1 fifth. We do need to find a common denominator. So that would be 10. So this would be 5 tenths plus 2 tenths. And remember, all we're doing to find that common denominator is if we multiply this one by 5 and this one by 2, it'll give us both the same denominator, but you have to do the same thing to the numerator as well. So we get 5 tenths plus 2 tenths, and that will add up to 7 tenths. So that will be the bottom part of the diamond. And that is it for this homework section.